Today's webinar is entitled on economic environment indicators. Uh, basically, when we are talking about economic environment indicators, we are essentially talking about economic variables. Now, when you talk about economic variables, it is important to understand uh, what do you mean by economics. Now, what happens in economics is that as we have limited resources, and all resources are possible, there you know there are multiple uses. Uh, that you can make out of the resources, plus the wants are unlimited. So basically, yes, in economics really boils down to the fact that you need to make use of scarce resources which have multiple uses to satisfy unlimited needs. Now, because of that, there is a problem of resource allocation that arises. Now, uh, economics itself can be divided into two parts, one is microeconomics and macroeconomics. When you are talking about microeconomics, we are talking about the firm, which is uh, a small unit, right? It can be a firm, it can be individual, it can be a single organization. So all the issues and problems that really relate to a particular unit of production or consumption uh, making its economic choices and that would be lie within the realm of microeconomics and the choices again are the same but the resources would be limited and they are subject to multiple uses so you need to take out the best productivity of those resources. Similarly in terms of macroeconomics, the macroeconomics is more macro in the, in, in the sense that it is relates to things which are have a wider ramification and which are subject to uh, uh, wider repercussions. Now, for example, you are talking about national income, employment, inflation, deflation, interest rates, monetary policy, fiscal policy. Now all these particular things affect a larger set right? and they affect multiple uh, businesses, production houses, uh, a number of individuals. So the effect is obviously going to be huge. Now when we talk about resources, we are basically talking about land, labor, capital and organization. Land, when we say land, we are talking about all natural resources. When we talk about capital, capital we are talking in terms of both in terms of monetary, in terms of uh, resources which can be used to uh, build capital as well as uh, you know in terms of plant and machinery. Then uh, labor is basically human resources which is used or which helps create capital. And then organization, organization is referred to as an entrepreneurial uh, asset which basically tries to combine both the land, labor and the capital to uh, create a viable and a productive unit. Now when we talk about uh, let's say in the Indian economy, the Indian economy or for that matter any other economy, we broadly divided into three sectors, primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary sector we are basically referring to is the agriculture. Secondary is basically we refer to as the manufacturing and tertiary is basically the ones which you know, provide uh, services to both the primary as well as the secondary. In other words, you can also label it as the agriculture sector, the manufacturing sector and the services sector. Now, uh, if you really look at, let's say, the progression of India, now India started from being a, a relatively an agricultural economy, but as its development has progressed with the financial sector development. There has been a lot of transition in terms of how uh, the uh, contribution to the GDP has changed. Earlier, the contribution of agriculture used to be around, you know, let's say 60 to 70 percent of the GDP. But now it may be only, you know, uh, maybe something like 10 percent. Whereas the services sector, which is something around 50, 55 percent, and the balance is contributed by the manufacturing sector. In any developed economy, uh, one would find that uh, the agriculture sector constitutes the lowest contribution to the GDP whereas uh, the manufacturing comes in second and the services sector constitute the largest contributor to the GDP. Now this is of a set that one finds even uh, in the Indian economy right? and uh, that is one, one sees that you know uh, agriculture is uh, still has a lot of significance in our uh, economy but in terms of contribution to the GDP uh, the proportion has uh, become much less. However, still uh, in terms of the employment potential, a uh, greater uh, majority for a population is still very much dependent on agriculture and light activities which may be forestry, fishing and basically in terms of the primary sector which is uh, basically livestock farming and related activities uh, and uh, concentrated in the uh, rural areas. The service sector is the highest growing and uh, that has uh, achieved phenomenal growth in the last couple of decades. Right? Now if you really look at in terms of the India growth story, well India has done phenomenally well. Uh, 
especially since 1991 when the reforms started. But yet, um, there have been some infrastructural handicaps, as I may say. Uh, when I say infrastructural handicaps, they basically relate to more in terms of uh, infrastructure, which is something like power, electricity. And uh, in those particular sectors, we have not been able to uh, have the kind of reform that we need. Road network, railways, uh, some sort of a social infrastructure with regard to education, health. Uh, these are particular areas where India really needs to devote its resources and where we are still uh, lagging behind. As in when we are able to solve this kind of infrastructure capacities in terms of uh, road networks, railways, and uh, power, electricity, and uh, plus, as I said, social infrastructure with regard to primary education, uh, health, uh, population control. Uh, this would make a quantum difference uh, at the rate at which India would grow. Now, uh, when you say infrastructure constraints, now uh, why does India have infrastructure constraints? One is, of course, the fact is that uh, being a poor country, uh, the amount of capital that we are able to contribute towards development is still limited right? and the capacity of the government to make expenditure is also limited by the fact that they cannot print notes infinitely because that would lead to large uh, inflationary pressures plus the government itself is grappling with large fiscal deficits and budgetary deficit right now uh, the fact remains is that when you're talking about fiscal deficit you are talking about uh, two aspects. One is the revenue expenditure and uh, in, uh, expenditure and the income, and the second is the capital expenditure and the uh, capital borrowings. Now, what happens is that uh, India still suffers from a revenue deficit, uh, though the tax revenues, tax and non-tax revenues have increased, but the revenue expenditure of the government still continues to grow at an alarming pace. Similarly, in terms of uh, the capital expenditure, uh, which again is made up of planned and non-planned expenditure. Now, plan expenditure is basically the ones for new projects and for infrastructure, whereas non-plan is, for example, subsidies, defense, uh, which continue to occupy a large proportion, right? And there is a heavy interest burden that the government also has. Uh, with the, uh, the result, what happens is that uh, the incremental amount that the government is able to invest in infrastructure is just not there. The private sector, though, has entered into the infrastructure sector, but with the kind of investment that is required, uh, the private sector is also not able to contribute to the extent that uh, it can. Plus, there is always the issue of incremental capital output ratio, wherein the amount of capital which is required to generate a single level of output happens to be quite high, which further you know, reduces the you know, uh, ability to make investments. In the infrastructure. For example, we have been lagging behind our power sector reforms to a considerable degree, and each of the planned targets uh, we have uh, missed out. And uh, there are a variety of other issues with regard to you know, land acquisition, to power sector reforms, to subsidies reforms, to pricing, market pricing uh, for, uh, for example, like uh, you know, uh, gas, to phasing out of subsidies, uh, to market pricing of actual goods and commodities to ensuring uh, basic needs and necessities for the population, to providing, uh, ensuring that there is enough food for everybody to coping with natural disasters and calamities. So with the kind of issues that one is facing, that the capacity of uh, the economy to actually move forward is severely uh, limited, right? Now, uh, one of course is mentioned is the fiscal deficit, which is uh, continues to be high as a proportion of the GDP and again it is partly because of the fact that the revenue expenditure is larger than the revenue income as well as uh, the capital borrowings is also quite high because that is used to finance the deficit and which further leads to increase in interest and that further leads on to uh, higher fiscal deficits. Now, because of high fiscal deficits and generally a, a monetary policy which can be expansionary as well, uh, that leads to inflation. Now, if you really look at uh, inflation, uh, the chief reason for inflation is that the supply of goods and services is less with comparison to the money supply in the economy. Now, the money supply in the economy, while the RBI tries its best to control inflation, there are some limiting factors for the RBI.
one of course is the fact that there has been in recent years a lot of capital flows in the economy plus the difference in the interest rates that means uh, the interest rates are in india and the interest rates are abroad that further leads to capital infusion in the country and that increases the high power money and that eventually leads to the growth in the money supply which the rbi is able to control to only a certain degree but uh, and it is not able to entirely sterilize those money flows so that leads to increase in money supply on the other hand because most of this money supply lead is uh, going towards consumption demand and not enough is being done towards infrastructure in that sense the uh, supply of goods and services is not going at that fast a pace which leads to a certain uh, amount of inflation now how do, does one measure inflation now inflation in india is measured by uh, three indices one is consumer price indices one is uh, wholesale price index and the third is gdp inflator now consumer price indices uh, they uh, the government of india has come out with four price indices one is is for agriculture workers one for rural workers